So uh, there are numerous relational uh, theoretical approaches, many of which are or can be viewed as post-humanist. In this paper, I'm going to stick with what I know best and talk about a theoretical position that utilizes new materialism and assemblage theory. I'll outline some of the main critiques that have landed at the feet of such uh, post-humanist approaches, and from this point of criticism, I go on to examine the relationship between new materialist assemblage approaches and power. I offer some thoughts on why new materialist and assemblage approaches have drawn such criticism for failing to engage with power within, within the archaeological community, and I offer the beginnings of a route forward. These are things that I've been thinking about for a while and I'm still putting together. Um, I had hoped to have space to offer a case study today, but um, time doesn't allow it, so it's pure theory and tag is the place for that. So what kind of theoretical approach do I adopt? There are a wide variety of relational approaches to society, and whilst they differ from each other, what they hold in common is how they focus on the way in which things are not just important in and of themselves, rather what matters is the relations which they emerge through. Such approaches are not completely homogenous as Craig excellently highlighted in the first paper. But generally speaking, they seek to elevate the position of non-humans, such as objects, plants, animals, soils, and rocks, and in some cases, beliefs and gods. And thereby, they aim to acknowledge the important roles that these varied components play in the world. I adopt a relational assemblage approach. Bennett describes assemblages as ad hoc groupings of diverse elements of vibrant materials of all sorts. Assemblages, she tells us, are living, throbbing confederations. For authors such as Deleuze, Bennett and Delanda, the world is made up of diverse, heterogeneous components, all of which exist and meshed within varied and multiple relations. Assemblages refer to the temporary groups these components might find themselves in. Any component can at the same time be part of numerous different assemblages and itself be seen as an assemblage. Connolly has shown the ways in which the properties of a given component are the result of the active relations and assemblages they exist within, rather than essential to that component. Relations within assemblages are relations of exteriority. This means one component can move to another assemblage or be part of it at the same time, and in that different the second assemblage, it will have a different effect and different properties as a result of the different relations that exist within. <coughs> The political philosopher Jane Bennett ties a new materialist concept of vital materialism to her assemblage approach, which I find really useful. Bennett argues that matter is not just brute dead material, but rather that it has a vitality and vibrancy. It's in flux, always changing at every scale. Things which might appear static, such as a road for example, are actually always vibrant. Matter shifts, the gravels and tars that make up the assemblage that is the road move. They erode. They're heated by the sun, they're cooled by the frost, they change. This vibrancy, Bennett argues, is as present in humans as it is in non-humans, and rather than seeing humans as exceptional, she sees them as just another example of vibrant matter. Post-humanism critiques the notion of human exceptionalism and seeks to decenter the human from our narratives. New materialist approaches, such as assemblage theory, are post-humanist due to their commitment to a flat ontology, their belief that all matter, both human and non-human, is active, unfixed, and capable of affect. They have a desire to elevate the position of the non-human components in our world. It's unsurprising that post-humanist approaches draw so much criticism. For a start, you could perceive them as a very threat to the entire discipline of the humanities and to the very definition of archaeology as the study of the human past through material remains. One of the things I hear most commonly in response to non-anthropocentric approaches like my own is, but I'm interested in humans. A post-humanist approach appears at least to threaten this interest. The majority of the archaeological critique that's directed at new materialist approaches seems to be directed specifically at their post-humanism. Drawing on a variety of critiques from authors such as Barrett, Ingold, Hodder and Van Dyck, there are several areas that cause particular unease. Firstly, critics are uncomfortable with the way in which new materialists reject the ontological divide between living and non-living things in our world. Second, critics feel that post-humanist approaches don't care about, focus on or engage with humans. Third, and strongly related to the second point, there's a suggestion that post-humanism has a number of ethical problems. 
These points of critique are often teamed with the argument that those archaeologists using new materialist approaches don't talk about identity, politics, social change, or power. These are all valid and important concerns. And in this paper, I focus on the way in which we butt up against these issues when we explore the relationship between posthumanism and power. So where then does power fit in a relational posthumanist approach? Any theoretical approach that places relations at its heart surely needs to consider power. Relations are wrought with power, the power of a government over its people, or a people to overturn their government, the power of a hunter over their prey, or the prey over the hunter, the power of things to shape our actions and landscapes to shape our lives. Power can be controlling, violent, physical, creative, collaborative, or resistive. Yet traditional views of power suggest that it's something that a subject wields over an object, whether those objects are things, animals, or other people. We also traditionally view power as something that humans possess, and more specifically, something that certain kinds of humans possess much more readily than others. In this kind of configuration, where power is associated with human exceptionalism, it's unsurprising that posthumanism might struggle to engage on these terms. Yet it is not the case that those utilizing post-human approaches don't engage with power. Delander writes extensively about the formation and maintenance of institutions, governments, and cities. Bredotti writes about the way in which capitalism seeks to control all living flesh. And Deleuze wrote a whole book about his good friend, Foucault, which of course deals explicitly with the topic of power, discussing what it is and how it works. It's not then that those who adopt posthumanist approaches are not concerned with power. I'd suggest that some of the critique of archaeological posthumanist assemblage approaches are because we as archaeologists haven't been engaging with power in our work recently. In some respects, our failure to address power in archaeological assemblage approaches can be, a res can be viewed as a result of their relative infancy. Authors are busy experimenting with how the application of this new kind of thinking affects archaeological research. However, I think there are two underlying stumbling blocks to writing post-humanist archaeological narratives that deal explicitly with power. Firstly, as Julian Thomas highlighted back in 2002, we often struggle to understand and imagine the exercise of power in, and experience of it in worlds that are unlike our own. Secondly, and most importantly, I think we're just not very comfortable talking about power beyond the human i.e. we're uncomfortable passing post-humanist power. What I would argue we need to clearly articulate is what power is and how it works in a non-anthropocentric approach. <clears throat> so how might we go about highlighting power in our interpretations of archaeological relational assemblages? The first point to address is the issue of flat ontologies. Arguing for a flat ontology means that no one component within, assemblage is, within an assemblage is deemed in advance to be more important than any other. This doesn't make humans and non-humans the same, rather it asks that we treat them equally in spite of their differences. For archaeologists, I believe there's real value in this approach as it allows us to move beyond our own assumptions about the ways in which societies past and present work. It makes space for different kinds of ontologies where objects, landscapes, animals, gods, camelids, are more powerful, where they, have, um, they can be understood differently in relation to people. This approach gives us the space to meet Julian Thomas's challenge from 2002 and think really differently about what power is and how it works. There are, however, a number of theoretical objections to a flat ontology that link to the general criticisms of post-humanism. Firstly, some suggest that using a flat ontology results in a situation where there is no power or social differentiation. And the key response to this is that starting with a flat ontology does not mean ending with one. Rather, it's about allowing power to emerge instead of deciding who, and it has historically been a male heterosexual human, will sit at the ontological apex. A second common objection suggests that adopting a flat ontology results in a devaluation of humans and, a stop, and stops us addressing key social justice concerns. The work of Rosie Bredotti in outlining the utility of posthumanism eloquently demonstrates that existing humanist and anthropocentric approaches have served only to elevate a certain subset of humans 
white straight men in particular. And that others, such as women, minorities, and indigenous groups, have rarely been elevated to this same position. Instead, they've been naturalized and othered. Accepting that our anthropocentric approaches have not valued all humans equally, in spite of their differences, is a key first step in the argument here. Post-humanism tries to increase the value of all humans and a diverse cast of others. For some authors, this is read as the devaluation of the human, but it's not a zero-sum game. Rather, post-humanism asks us to appreciate the role of other non-humans and appreciate that we ourselves are so thoroughly enmeshed and entangled with these non-human others that we're actually inseparable from them. It's not saying that humans are not clever or powerful or capable of tremendous and terrifying action in the world. It's just saying that they're never capable of it without others and that those others have a potential to carry out such actions too. Rather than calling upon human exceptionalism to explain the nature of our world and the change in action we see in it, a non-anthropocentric approach asks us to appreciate the role that others play as well. Turning to social justice issues, for me, a non-anthropocentric approach offers a positive alternative, contra Ruth Van Dyke. Post-humanism doesn't preclude us from doing research that seeks to highlight injustice, nor does it stop us from researching humans. If we can accept the world as relational and no human acts alone, then to focus only on humans when we're trying to tackle big problems seems foolhardy. If we want to make inroads into the battles to achieve gender equality, to treat refugees with compassion, or to reduce the, uh, the devastating effects of climate change, then our understanding of these problems and the solutions to them has to include non-humans too. All that said, it's not the case that we cannot blame humans when they enter into powerful and damaging configurations. There's space within a flat ontology for humans to emerge as very powerful components. And there's also space for us to be outraged and seek justice. But in trying to understand and overcome injustice, we do better to appreciate that non-humans have a role to play too. Despots and dictators should be brought to justice, but we should also understand the role played by gunpowder, oil, arms manufacturers, and even the climate in our wars. In seeking to change and collaborate with these components, as well as the humans involved, we may have more success in our fights for social justice. I've argued thus far that power has to be a key vector in an assemblage approach, as there are no relations that are not subject to power. I've argued that developing a flat ontology does not mean eschewing the, import the importance of power and social differentiation. However, the traditional formulation of power is not compatible with post-humanist theoretical approaches. What is needed now is a means to reframe that understanding of power. So how might we understand post-humanist power? Throughout this paper, I've called upon a traditional reading of power that sees it as the privilege of human exceptionalism and something to be possessed and exercised over others. There are, of course, far more complex, nuanced and accurate understandings of power. Foucault's body of work on power has been important and influential within academia for decades. And Foucault himself was not a relationalist or a post-humanist thinker, though aspects of his work could well be read as moving in that direction. Deleuze's 1986 volume, Foucault, offers us one of a great many readings of Foucault's work, and one that, by the nature of its author, is compatible with a relational assemblage-based approach. <coughs> Deleuze suggests that there are three main aspects to Foucault's work on power. He tells us that power is not essentially repressive, since it incites, it induces, it seduces. He tells us that it's practiced before it's possessed, since it is possessed only in a determinable form, that of class, and a determined form, that of the state. And he tells us that it passes through the hands of the mastered, no less than the hands of the masters. Deleuze states that power does not, quote, emanate from a central point or a unique locus of sovereignty, but at each moment moves from one point to another in a field of forces, marking inflections, resistances, twists and turns. Power is unhierarchical, it's twisting and messy, like Deleuze's rhizome. Drawing on Foucault, Deleuze tells us that power has no form, but rather shows up as an affect. It's both the ability to affect and to be affected. 
Power is never singular, but instead always relational, and therefore it has no subject nor object. Power has a crucial role in determining the properties and particular affects that a given component can have. Power then is a crucial aspect of the relations that determine the properties and potentials of the components that make up our relational world. Such an approach holds much in common with the Foucauldian inspired work of Miller and Tilly from the 1980s when they talked about power to versus power, power over. They sought to reframe power not just as something negative but also as something positive that allows us to act and creates fields of discourse and knowledge. Where assemblage theory goes beyond Miller and Tilly is in the assertion that power is not limited to humans. And when it comes to thinking about power beyond humans, I think the work of Jane Bennett is most <coughs> useful. Bennett talks in her work about thing power, which she describes as the curious ability of inanimate things to animate, to act, to produce effects, dramatic and subtle. She rejects human exceptionalism and the separation of the human from the non-human and as such, talks of vibrancy and thing power as capacities that arise from confederations of people as easily as confederations of things. She seeks specifically to level the playing field, to start from the flat ontology and to trace vibrancy and thing power from that start point. For her, there is no human agency. Human agency is merely another example of thing power. Like Deleuze, she follows a model where power has no single locus, no one thing has the ability to control everything else. Instead, power is unequally distributed across assemblages, and often greatest where numerous heterogeneous components come together. One way to think through the power of various confederations within an assemblage is to look at which ones are acting to de-territorialize and territorialize that assemblage. Delanda uses the term territorialized to describe how components within an assemblage may act to make the boundaries of that assemblage more defined and the components within it more homogenous. Equally, components may act to destabilize the assemblage, to blur the boundaries and make the identity of the assemblage less clear. And this is what he terms deterritorialization. Assemblages have components that are acting to territorialize, and those that are acting to deterritorialize, and one component may do both at any given time. By identifying confederations of components that are acting together in these ways, we can begin to think about power in a way that doesn't assume it will be limited to humans and focuses on relations as the locations that power emerges from. So where does this leave us? Rethinking the role of humans doesn't mean we need to lose power from our narratives, but allows us to gain, I would argue, a more accurate perspective on power than we've hitherto had. I believe it's vital that our narratives are wrought with what Bennett calls the awesome, awful powers of humanity, but that we also make space for the power of non-humans and understand that power is only present in relational, heterogeneous and vibrant assemblages. Most importantly, it's only when we consider power that we can write the kinds of narratives that reflect the complexity of our worlds, both past and present. Thank you very much for listening.